vampire. It happened that in the midst of disputations attendant upon the London winter, there appeared at various parties of the leaders a ton of noblemen, who, more remarkable for his singularities than his rank, he gazed upon the mirth around him, as if he could not participate therein. Apparently the light laughter of the fair only attracted his attention, that he might by a look quell it, and throw fear into those breasts where foolishness reigned. Those who felt his sensation of awe could not explain whence it rose. Arose such a tribulation to the dead grey eye, which, fixing upon the object's face, did not seem to penetrate. At one glance to pierce through to the inward workings of the heart, but fell upon the cheek with a laden ray that weighed upon the skin. It could not pass. His peculiarities caused him to be invited to every house. All wished him to see him. Those who had been accustomed to violent incitement now felt the weight of new. They were pleased of having something in their presence capable of engaging their attention. In spite of the deadly hue of his face, which never gained a warmer tint, neither from the blush of modesty or from the strong emotion of passion. Though its form and outline were beautiful, many of the female hunters, after the no- after notoriety, attempted to win his attentions and gain, at last, some marks of what might term affection. Lady Mercer, who had been the mockery of every monster, soon in the drawing room since her marriage, threw herself in his way, all but put on the dress of a Montague bank to attract his non- 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 notice, though in vain, when she stood before him, through his eyes were apparently fixed upon hers, still it seemed as if they were unperceived, even on appalled imprudence was baffled. She left the field, but through the common address, could not influence even the guidance of his eyes, it was not that the female sex was indifferent to him, yet such was the apparent caution to which he spoke to the vir- virtuous wife and innocent daughter. A few knew he ever addressed himself to the females. He had, however, the reputation of a winning tongue, and whether it was a, that that it even overcame the dread of his singular character, or they moved by his apparent hatred of voice, he was as often among their females. As females who formed a boast of their sex from their domestic virtues, as among those who sullied it by their vices. But at the same time there came to London a young gentleman of the name of Aubrey. He was an orphan, left with an only sister, in possession of great wealth by parents who died while he was yet in childhood. Left also to himself by guardians who thought it was their duty merely to take care of his fortune. While they relinquished a more important charge of his mind to the care of mercy subordinates, he cultivated more his imagination than his judgment. He had hence that high romantic feeling of honour and candour which daily ruins so many millers and princesses. He believed all to sympathise with virtue, and thought that vice was thrown in by providence, merely for the pressure of extra fate. The scene, as we see in romances, he thought the misery of cottage merely consisted in the vesting of clothes which were as warm, but were better adapted to the painter's eye by the irregular folds and various coloured patches. He thought in fine that the dreams of poets were realities of life. He was handsome, frank, and rich. For those reasons, upon his entering into the gay circles, many brothers surrounded him. Striving which could describe, should describe with least truth, their languishing or romping favourites, the daughters at the same time, by their brightening countenances, when he approached, and by their sparkling eyes he had opened his lips, soon lent him to false notions of his talents and his merit. Attached as he was to the romance of his solitary hours, he was startled at finding, except in the tallow and candle waxes, a flickered, that even that from the presence of a ghost, but for want of nothing, there was no foundation in real life for any of the, that conjuries of pleasing pictures 
and descriptions are contained in those volumes for which he formed his study. Buying Heather some compensation in his gratitude, pride, vanity, he is about to relinquish his dreams when the extraordinary being he we have been above described crossed him in his career. We watched him. We watched him, and very possibly of forming an idea, a character man entirely absorbed in himself. He gave few other signs of his observation. External objects, when a tacit or acid, although their their existence implied by the avoidance of their contact, allowing his imagination to picture everything that flattered its prosperity to extractate ideas, he soon formed this object into the hero of romance. Determined to observe the offspring of his fancy, rather than one person, rather than the person before him, he became acquainted with him, paid him attentions, and so far advanced upon his notice that his presence was always recognised. He gradually learned that Lord Ruffin's affairs were embarrassed, and soon found from the notes of preparation in the street he was about to tr- to travel, der- der- serious of gaining some. Information respecting a singular character, whom till now had only whetted his curiosity, he hinted to his guardians it was time for him to perform the tour, which was which for many durations had been thought necessary to enable the young to take some rapid steps in the career of vice towards putting themselves upon the reality with the aged, not allowing them to appear as if fallen from the skies, with ever scandalous Antiquities were mentioned as the subject's presentry or of praise according to the degree of skill school. Soon in, in carrying them on, he consented, and Aubrey immediately mentioning his attentions to Lord Rathaven was surprised to receive from him a proposal to join him, flattered by such a mark of esteem from him, who apparently had nothing in common with the um, other man. He gradually accepted it, and in a few days they had passed the circling waters. Hitherto, Aubrey had no opportunity of studying Lord Raffin's character, and now he found that though many more of his actions were exposed to his view, the results often different, offered different conclusions from the apparent motives of his conduct. His companion was profuse in his liberty, the idol, the vagabond, and the beggar. Received from his hand more than enough to relieve their immediate wants, but Aubrey could not avoid remarking that it was not upon the virtues reduced to indulgence by the misfortunes attendants, even upon virtue that he bestowed his arms. These were sent from the door from Harley's suppressed ears, but when the prefectlant came to ask something not to relieve his wants, but to allow him to wallow in his lust, or to sink him still deeper in his secretary, he was sent away with rich territory. This, however, attributed by him to the greater potency of the vicious which generally prevails over the retiring bachelors of the virtuous indignant. There was one circumstance about the charity of his lordship which is still more pressed upon his mind all those upon whom bestowed eventually found that there were there was a curse upon it, for all either led to the scaffold or sunk to the lowest and most abject misery, and Brussels and other towns through which they passed, or we were surprised at the apparent eagerness which his companions sought for the centres of all fashionable vice, where he entered all the spirit of the fellow table, he betted and always gambled with success. Except when he no no sharper was his antagonist, he lost even more than he gained, but he was always with the same unchanging face, which he generally watched the society around. It is not, however, so when he encountered the rash, youthful novice, or the luckless father of a numerous family. Then his lucky wish seemed fortunate law, his apparent abstractness, of the mind was laid aside, his eyes sparkled with more fire than that of a cat while dangling with a half deafened mouse. In every town he left a formerly abundant youth, 
torn from the circle he adored, cursing the solitude of the dungeon, a fate had drawn him within the reach of his brain. Well, many a father sat frantic, a mist of speaking looks of mute, hungry children, about the single farthing of his late immense wealth, within to buy even significant to satisfy their present craving. Yet he took no money from the gambling table, but immediate loss to the ruiner of many, a last greater he had just snatched from the compulsive grasp of the innocent. This might be the result of a certain degree of knowledge, which not have a capable combating a cunning of mo- or the more experienced or we often wish to represent this to his friend and begged him to resign that charity and pleasure would provide the ruin of all and did not attend to his own profit but he delayed it for every day he hoped that his friend would give him for some opportunity of speaking frankly and opening to him however he's never this never occurred lord of the river in his carriage and amidst the various wild and rich screens of nature was always the same. His eyes spoke less than his lip, and though Audrey was near the object, object of his curiosity, he attained so no greater gratification from it than consent excitement of the vainly wishing to break that mystery which his exalted imagination began to assume the appearance of something supernatural. He soon arrived at Rome, and Audrey for time lost sight of his companion. He left him in daily attendance upon the morning circle of an Italian countess. Whilst he was went in search of the memorials of another almost deserted city, whilst he was thus engaged, letters arrived from England, which he opened with eager impatience. The first was from his sister, breathing nothing but affection. The others were from his guardians. A letter astonished him. It was if it had before entered into his imagination, there was an evil power Barrow, resident in his companion, he seemed to give them a significant reason for the belief. His guardians insisted upon his immediately leaving his friend, and urged his character was dreadfully vicious, for that possession of irresistible powers of seduction rendered his luxurious habits more dangerous to society. He had been discovered that his contempt for the adulteress had not originated in hatred of her character, that he had acquired and enhanced the gratification that his victim, the partner of his guilt, should be hurled from the pinnacle of unsullied virtue down to the lowest abyss of the degradation. In fine, that all those females whom he sought, apparently on the account of virtue, had since his departure thrown either mask aside and not scrupled to expose the whole deformity of their vices to the public gaze. All been determined upon leaving one whose character has not yet shown a single bright point on which to rest the eye, resolved to invent some plausible pretext of abandoning him altogether, proposing in the meanwhile to watch him more closely and let no sight of circumstances pass by unnoticed. He entered into the same circle and soon perceived that his lordship was endowing to work upon the experience. In experience of the daughter of a lady whose house he chiefly frequented, in literally it's seldom that unmarried female was met with in society. He was therefore obliged to carry on his plans in secret, while his eye followed him in all their windings and soon discovered that a cessation had been appointed which most likely ended in the ruin of an innocent, though faultless girl. Losing our time, he entered the apartment of Lord Referring and abruptly asking him his attentions with respect to the lady, informing him at the same time he was aware of his being about to meet him the very night. Lady Rathman answered that his attentions were such as he proposed, or would have upon such occasion, upon being pressed, whether he intended to marry her, merely laughed. Or we retired, immediately writing a note to say that from the moment he must decline out the crime, his lordship to the main of the proposed tour. He ordered his servant to seek other apartments, and calling upon the mother of the lady, informed her all of all he knew, not only with regard to her daughter, but also concerning the character of his lordship. The assassination was prevented. Assassination was prevented. Lord Reverend, the next day, merely sent his servant 
to notify his compelled consent to a separation, but does not hint any suspicion of his plans being foiled by Aubrey's interposition. Having left Rome, Aubrey directed his step towards Greece, and crossing the Valencia, soon found himself at Athens. He then fixed his residence in the house of a Greek, and soon occupied himself in tracing the faded records of ancient glory upon monuments that were apparently ashamed of chronicling the deeds of free men only before slaves had hidden themselves beneath the sheltering soil of many coloured lichen. Under the same roof as in myself, himself, as it did a being so beautiful and delicate, he might have formed a model of a painter wishing to betray on canvas the promised hope of the faithful and motorats to paradise, save that her eyes spoke to much mind. For one to think she would belong to those who had no souls, she danced upon the plain or tripped along the mountain side. One would have thought the gazelle a poor type of her beauties, for who would have exchanged her eye, apparently the eye of an analytic nature, for that sleepy, lustrous look the animal suited but to the taste of a, a cure, a lightest slip of envate, often accompanied. Aubrey, in his search for those antiquities, and often would the unconscious girl engage in pursuit of Cashmere's butterfly, show the whole beauty of her form, floating as if upon the wind to the eager gaze of him, who forgot the letters he had just deciphered upon an almost infaced tablet in the computation of her scythe like figure, upon often her tresses falling as she flirted around, exhibited in the sun ray such delicately brilliant and swift in fading hues, he might well excuse the forgetfulness of his antiquity, who let escape from his mind the very object which he before thought of very vital importance to the proper in- interpretation a passage in Paleusenius. But why attempt to describe charms which all feel, but none can appreciate. It was innocence, youth, and beauty, unaffected by crowded drawing rooms and stifling balls. Whilst he drew their remains, of which he wished to preserve a memorial of his future hours, she would stand by and watch the magic effects of his pencil. In tracing the scenes of her native place, she would then describe to him the circling dance upon the open plain, would paint to him in all the glowing colours of youthful memory. The marriage romp she remembered viewing in her infancy, and then returning to the subjects, apparently made a greater impression upon her mind, and tell him all the supernatural tales of her nurse, her eagerness and apparent belief of what she narrated, excited the interest even Aubrey, often as she tell him the tale of the living vampire, who had passed years amidst his friends and dearest ties, forced every year by feeding upon the life of loving female who prolonged his existence for the ensuing months. His blood would run cold while he attempted to laugh her out of such idle and horrible fantasies. But in the fell, cited to him the names of old men, whom at least last detected some living among themselves. Others several with their near relatives and children had found marked with a stamp the fiend's appetite. But when she found him so incredulous, she begged of him to believe her, for he had been remarked that those who dared to question his existence always had some proof given or obliged them with grief and heartbreaking to confess it was true. She detailed to him the traditional appearance of these monsters. His horror was increased by the hearing a pretty accurate description Lord Reverend. He himself still persisted in assuming her. Like there may be no truth in her fears, though at some time he wondered how many coincidences which all tended to recite a belief in the supernatural power of Lord Referin. Aubrey began to attach himself more and more to the even if free. Her innocence so contrasted with all the affected vices of the women among them, whom he had sought his vision or romance, won his heart. Well, he recalled who called the idea of the young men of English habits marrying an uneducated 
a dedicated Greek girl. Still, he found himself more and more attached to the almost very form before him. He would tear himself at times from her, forming a plan from some inquisitive research. He would depart, determined not to return till his object was attained. For he always found it impossible to fix his attention upon the ruins around him. Whilst in his mind he retained an image that seemed alone the rightful possessor of his faults, his name was unconscious of his love, and was ever the same frank infidel being he had first known. She always seemed to be part from him with reluctance. But it was because she was no longer any one with whom she could visit her favourite haunts. Whilst her garden was occupied in sketching or uncovering some fragment which had yet escaped the destructive hand of time, she appealed to her parents on the subject of vampires, and they both, with so verbal present, affirmed his innocent pale with horror by the same name. Soon after, Veldry determined to proceed upon one of his excursions which would detain him for a few hours. When they heard the name of the place, they all at once begged of him not to return at night, as he might necessarily pass through a wood where no Greek would ever remain. After they had closed upon them any consideration, they had described it as the result of the vampires in eternal orgies, they announced the most e- heavy evils that are pending upon him who did dare to cross their path. Or we made light of their representations and tried to laugh them out. The idea which he saw them shudder at his daring last to mark a superior infernal power, a very name of which apparently made their blood freeze. He was silent. Next morning, Audrey set upon his excursion unattended. He was surprised to observe the melancholy face of his host and was concerned to find his own words mocking the belief of those horrible fiends inspired them with much such terror he was about to depart if he came to the side of his horse and earnestly begged of him to return here a night allow the power of those beings to be put in action he promised he was however so occupied in research he did not perceive that daylight would soon end and that in the horizon there was one of those specks which the warmer climates so rapidly gather in a tremendous mass and pour all their rage upon the devoted country. He at last, however, mounted his horse, determined to make up by speed of his delay, but he was too late. Twilight in those the southern climates, it is almost unknown immediately the sun sets. Night begins, and here he had advanced far, and a powder storm was above. His aquiline thunders had scarcely internal rest. His thick, heavy rain forced it away through the canopy foliage, whilst the blue fault of lightning seemed to fall and radiate his very feet. Suddenly his horse looked right, took right. He was carried and dreadfully rapidly through the entangled forest. The animal at last, through fatigue, stopped. He found by the glare of lightning that he was in the neighbourhood of a hovel that hardly lifted itself up from the mass of dead leaves and brushwood which surrounded it. Dismounting, he approached, hoping to find some one to guide him to the town, or at least trusting to claim shelter from the pelting of the storm. As he approached the thunders, for a moment silent, allow, allowed him to hear the dreadful shrieks of a woman mingling the stifled, suited mockery of a laugh. Continued in one way, one almost unbroken sound, he was startled by roused by the thunder which rolled upon over his head. He, with a sudden effort, forced open the door of the hut. He found himself in utter darkness. A sound, however, guided him. He was apparently unperceived for. Though he called, still the sounds continued, and no notice was taken of him. He found himself in contact with someone, whom he immediately seized, but a voice cried, again baffled, which he now laughed as he did. He felt himself grappled by someone whose strength seemed supernatural. Determined to sell his life as dearly as he could, he struggled, but he was vain. He lifted from his feet and held with enormous force against the ground. His enemy threw himself upon him, and leaning upon his breast, placed his hands upon his throat. When the glare of the many torches penetrating the hole, 
again light and day disturbed him. He is he rose, and leaving his prey, brushed from the door. In a moment the crushing of branches that he broke through the wood was no longer heard. The stone was now still, and all being incapable of moving was soon heard by those without. He entered the light of their torches, fell upon the mud walls, a thatch loaded with every individual straw, with heavy flakes of soot. At the desire of Aubrey, they searched for her, who had attracted him by her cries. He was again left in darkness, but what was his ho- that? But what was his horror? When the light of the torches once more burst upon him, perceived that every form of his fairly conductress brought in a lifeless corpse, he shut his eyes, hoping it was but a vision arising from his disturbing imagination. He again saw the same form. When he enclosed them, stretched by his side, there was no colour upon her cheek, not even upon her lip, yet those was a stillness upon her face, that seemed almost an attracting as a life that once dwelt there. On her neck and breast were blood, was blood. Upon her throat were the marks of teeth, having opened the vein. To this the man pointed, then pointed, crying simultaneously, struck with fire, a vampire, a vampire. A litter was quickly formed, and Aubrey's lay to the side of her, who had lately been to him the object of so many bright and very visions, now fallen with the flower of life, and had died within her. He knew not what his thoughts were. His mind was being numbed, and seemed to shun reflection, and take refuge in vacancy. He held, held almost unconsciously his hand a naked dagger, a particular construction, which had been been found in the hut. They were soon met by very different parties who soon who had been engaged in the search of her whom her mother had missed. Their lament cries as they approached the city for wound, appearances of some dreadful catastrophe. To describe their grief would be impossible, but when they asserted the cause of their child's death, they looked over him and pointed to the corpse. They were inconsolable. Both died broken hearted. All we being put to bed was seized with the most violent fever, but was soon was often delirious. In those intervals he would call upon Lord Rafferin, and upon Liver Liver Liverate. By some uncannable combination he found seemed to beg of his former companion to spare the being he loved, as sometimes he would in in persate mal Dictions upon his head and curse him as a destroyer. Love ref been chance that he's about time to arrive at Athens, and from whatever motive, upon hearing of the state of Aubrey, immediately placed himself in the same house and came his constant attendant. When the latter had recovered from his delirium, he was horrified and startled by the sight of him whose image he had now combined with that of the vampire, of the Lord Raphrin, by his kind words applying almost reverence. For the fault that caused their separation was still more by the tension, anxiety, and care he showed. Some soon would counsel him to his presence. His lordship seemed quite changed, no longer appeared at the apathetic being who was so astonished over him. But soon, as his convalescence began to be rapid, he again gradually retired in the same state of mind, or we perceived no difference from the former man, except that at times his eyes and meet his gaze, fixed intently upon him, with a smile of malicious exultion, playing upon his lips, he knew not why, but his smile haunted him. During the last stage of the invalid's recovery, Lord Rutherford was apparently engaged in watching the tireless waves, Raised by the cooling breeze or mar- markings of progress, there's all circling like our world, and moveless move sun. Indeed, he appeared to wish to avoid the eyes of all. All his mind by his shock was much weakened. That was excessivity of the spirit which had once so diminished him now seemed to have fled forever. He was now as much a lover of solitude and silence as Lord Raphael. But much as he wished for solitude, his mind could not find it in the neighbourhood of Athens. He thought it missed the ruins he had free work gri- fully for work rented. Neferin's form stood by his side. If he had sought it in the woods, 
a light step would appear wandering amidst the underwood in quest of the modest pilot, when suddenly turning around would show at his wild imagination a pale face and wounded throat with a meek smile upon her lips. He determined to fly his scenes, each every feature of which created such bitter associations in his mind. He opposed to Lord Rathalbin, to whom he held himself abound by tender care he taken of him during his illness. They should visit these parts of Greece, neither had yet seen. They travelled in every, every direction, they sought every spot of which a great question could be attached. But though they thus hastened from place to place, yet they seemed not to heed what they had gazed upon. They heard much of robbers, but they gradually began to sight those reports, which they imagined were only the invention of individuals whose interest it was to cite to generosity those who had defended from pretended dangers. In consequence of thus directing the advice of the inhabitants, on one occasion they travelled with only a few guards, more to serve as guides than as defence. Upon entering, however, a narrow defile, at the bottom of which the bed of torrent, with large masses of rock brought down from the neighbouring premises, they resolved to repent their legitimate the direction, for scarcely were the whole of the party engaged in the narrow pass when they were startled by the whistling of bullets close to their heads by the echoed report of several guns. And instantly the guards had left them, and placing themselves behind rocks, began to fire in the direction whence the report came. Lord Rafferin and Valentry, imitating their example, retired from them behind the sheltering turn of the bow. By seeing the being thus detained by Bo, who was solely in shouts, bade them advance and be exposed to an resisting slaughter if any of the robbers should climb above and take them in the rear, but determined at once to rush forward in the search of the enemy. Hardly had they lost the shelter of the rock when Lord Raphael received a shot in the shoulder, which had brought him to the ground. Over he hastened to his sisters, and no longer heeding the contest of his own peril, was soon surprised to see the robber's face around him, his guards having, upon Lord Raffarin's being wounded, immediately threw up their arms and surrendered. When promises of great reward already soon induced them to convey his wounded friend to the neighbouring cabin, they were agreed, having agreed upon the ransom, he was no more disturbed by their presence. They, being content merely to guard their interests, still their comrade should still Till their comrades should return the promised sum, for which he had an order. Lord Raphael's strength rapidly decreased. In two days, mortification ensued, and death seemed advancing with hasty steps. His conduct and appearance had not changed. He seemed as unconscious pain he had been of the objects around him, but towards the close of the last evening, his mind became apparently uneasy. His eyes upon, often fixed upon, Aubrey, who was reduced to offer, the assistance with more than usual urgency. Assist me, you may save me. You may may do more than that. I mean not to my life. I heed the death of my assistance. As little as that the passing day. You may save my honour, your friend's honour. How, tell me, how I could be doing anything if I don't agree. I need not little. My life ebbs and buys. I cannot explain the whole. If I could steal all... You know of me, my honour were free from stain in the world's mouth. And if my death were unknown for some time in England, I but life shall not be known. Swear, cried the dying man, raising himself exultant with violence. Swear by all your soul reverses, reveres, by all your nature's fears. Swear that for a year and a day you will not impart your knowledge of my crimes or death to any living being in any way, whatever may happen or may, whoever, whatever, you may see. His eyes seem busting from this first evil. Their sockets, I swear, said Aubrey. He sank laughing upon his pillow, and breathed no more. <clears throat> Aubrey retired to rest, but did not sleep. The many circumstances attending his acquaintance with this man rose upon his mind. He knew not why, but he remembered his oaths of cold stripping came to him, as if he is for the presentment of something horrible awaiting him. 
Rising early in the morning, he was about to enter the hovel, which he had left the corpse, when a robber met him, and informed him that he was no longer there, having been conveyed by himself and comrades upon his tiring principle of the neighbouring mount. According to a promise they had given his lordship, he would be not should he be exposed to the first cold ray of the moon rose above his bed. Of his death, Aubrey, astonished and um, taking several of the men, determined to go and bury it upon the same spot where it lay. But when he had mounted to the summit, he found no trace of either the corpse or clothes which the robbers swore they pointed out, an identical rock which they laid the body. By the time his mind was bewildered in conjectures, but he at last returned, convinced that they had buried the corpse for the sake of the clothes. Where you look his the country in which he met with such terrible revulsions, in which all we apparently conspired to heighten the suspicious melancholy that he seized upon his mind, he resolved to leave it and soon arrived in Samaria. While waiting for a vessel to occupy him to an old Torrento or to Naples, he occupied himself in arranging those effects he had with him belonging to Ref- Lord Rathlin. Among other things, there was a case containing several weapons of offence, more or less adapted to desire the entire, to ensure the death of the victim. There were several daggers and atatagogons. Whilst turning them over and examining their curious forms, yet he was surprised at finding a shelf, chief apparently ornamented in the same style as the dagger discovered in the fatal hut. He shuddered, hastening to gain further proof. He found the weapon in his horror may be imagined when he discovered that it fitted through though particularly shaped the sheath he held in his hand. His eyes seemed to need no further certainty. Yet seemed gazing to be bound to the dagger, yet still he wished to to, be, to disbelieve the particular form, the same varying tints upon the heart. The sheath was alike. He spent on both, left no room to doubt. They were also drugged of blood on each. He left Samaria on his way at Rome. His first inquiries were concerning the lady who had attempted to snatch the Lord Vesperin's such as arms. Arts. Her parents were in distress, their fortune ruined. She had been not, not heard of since his march with lordship, where his mind became almost broken. Under so many repen- repeated horrors, he was afraid that this lady had fallen victim destroyer of everything. He became morose and silent. His only occupation consisted in urging the knee speed of their positions, as if he were going to save the life of someone he had de- held dear. He arrived at Calice, a breeze which seemed obedient. His will soon baffled him to the English shores. He hastened to the mansion of his father's. There was for a moment of him to lose Embraces the caresses of his sister, all memory of the past. It she, before her infantine caresses, had gained his affection. Now the woman began to appear. She was still attracting as a companion. Mrs. Aubrey had not the winning grace which gains the gaze, applause of the drawing room assemblies. It was none of that light brilliancy which only exists in the heated atmosphere of a crowded apartment. Her blue eye was never lit up by the levity of the mind beneath. There was a melancholy charm about it, which did not seem to rise from his fortune, but from some feeling within that appeared to indicate the soul conscious of a brightening realm. A step was not the light setting, which phrase wears a butterfly or colour may attract it. It was sedate and pensive. When alone, her face was never brightened by the smile of joy. But when her brother breathed to her his affection, and would in her presence forget those griefs she soon she knew destroyed his rest, whom would have estranged a smile for that of a voluntary? As he did that her eyes, her face were playing in the light of their own native spear. She was yet only eighteen, had not even had not been presented to the world, if having been thought by her guardians more fit and her presentation should be delayed upon her father brother's return on the continent he might be her protector it was now therefore resolved that the next drawing room as fast approaching should be approached for entry into the busy scene 
what we would rather have remained in the mansion of his father's and fed upon the melancholy which overpowered him. He could not feel interest from further reasons of fashionable strangers. His mind had been so torn by the events he had witnessed, but he was determined to sacrifice his own comfort the protection of his sister. He soon arrived in town and prepared for the next day when he announced at a drawing room. The crowd was excessive. A drawing room had not been held for a long time. All who were anxious to bask in the smile of royalty hastened into her. Aubrey was there with his sister. While he was standing in a corner by himself, he lit the all around him, engaged in a remembrance of the first time he did even he seen Lord Reverend was in that very place. He felt himself seized by the arm, and the voice he recognised too well sounded in his ear. Remember your oath? He had hardly cherished to turn, fearful to have seen the spectre a blast him, when he received a little distance the same figure that had, which had attracted his notice at this spot upon his first entry into society. A gaze still his limbs, almost refusing to bear their weight, he obliged to take the arm of the friend, and forcing the passage for the crowd, he threw himself into his carriage, and was driven home, he paced the room, which hurried steps, and fixed his hand upon his head. He is afraid of his thoughts were bustling from his brain. Love for Ephraim again before him. Circumstances started to be up. Started up a dreadful array. A dagger, his oath. He'd aroused himself. He did not believe it. He promised. Puzzled. A dead phrase again. He thought his imagination had conjured up the image of his mind. Resisting upon it's impossible. It could, it could be real. He determined, therefore, to go again into society through which he attempted to ask concerning Lord Rafferin. The name hung upon his lips. He could not succeed in gaining the information. He went a few nights after we, we, after with his sister assembly of a near relation. Leaving her under the protection of a matron, he retired to recess and there gave himself up to his own devouring thoughts. Perceiving at last that many were leaving, he roused himself and entering another room, found his sister surrounded by several apparently in earnest conversation. He attempted to pass and get near her, and when one whom he requested to move turned around and revealed to him the features he must afford, he sprang forward, seized his sister's arm, and hurried stepped forced her towards the street. A door he found himself impeded by the crowds of servants who were waiting for their lords, and while he was engaged in passing them, he heard a whis- voice whisper close to him, Remember your oath. He did not dare to turn, a hurrying his sister soon reached home. Aubrey soon almost became almost attracted, distracted. If before his mind had been dissolved by one other subject, much more more completely was it in gross. Now that the certainty that the monster living again pressed upon his thoughts, his sister's attentions were now unneeded. It was in vain that she entreated him to explain to her. What had caused his abrupt conduct? He only uttered a few words. Those terrified her. A world the more he thought, the more he was bewildered. His oath startled him. Was he then to allow this month to roam, burying ruin upon his breath, amongst all he held dear, and not avert it his progress? His very sister might have been touched by him. But even if he were to break his oath, to close his suspicions, who would believe him? He thought of employing his own hand to free the world from such a wretch, but death, he remembered, had been uh, had been already mocked. For days he remained in this state, shut by his room. He saw no one, and yet only when his sister came, who, with eyes streaming with tears, besought him for his sake, the sake to support nature. At last, no longer capable of bearing stillness and solitude, he left his house, roamed from the street to street, anxious to fly that image which haunted him. His dress became neglected. He wondered at, as often supposed the noonday sun as to the midnight damps. He was no longer to be recognised. He first he returned from the evening to the house. At last he lay down to rest without fatigue. Whatever fatigue overtook him. His sister, anxious for his safety, employed people to follow him, but he was soon distanced by him who fled from a pursuer swifter than they, any their fault. His conduct, however, suddenly changed, stuck with the idea, left from it by his actors, a hoy of his friends, with a fiend amongst them. 
of whose presence they were unconscious, determined to enter again in society, and watching closest, the anxious of forlorn, in spite of his woe, oh, whom oh, Lord Rathorin approached with embassy. But when he entered into the room, his haggard and suspicious looks were so striking, his inward struggling so visible, that his sister was last obliged to beg him to abstain from seeking her stake, a society which affected him so strongly. When, however, remorse, remorse and state traits, stance, proved unavailing, unavailing, the guardians thought proper to impose, interpose, and fearing that his mind was coming alienated, they thought it high time to resume it again, a trust of which they had been before imposed upon them by over his parents. The delirious of saving him from the injuries and sufferings he had daily encountered in his wanderings, preventing him from exposing the general eye with their marks, of what they considered folly, they engaged a physician to reside in the house and took constant care of him. He hardly appeared, appeared to notice it. So completely was his mind absorbed by one terrible subject. His incoherence became at so last so great he is confined to his chamber. There he could often lie for days incapable of being aroused. He became emancipated, his eyes attained a glassy lustre, and any sign of affection and recollection remained displayed itself upon the entry of his sister, whom he so, so, would sometimes start, and seizing her hand with, look, with locks, it severely affected her. He would desire her not to touch him. Oh, do not do touch him, who, if your love for me is aught, do not go near him. Whenever she inquired to whom, he referred, his only answer was true, true, and again he sunk into a state whence not even she could arouse him. This lasted many months. Gradually, however, as a year was passing, his incurrences came less frequent. His mind threw off a portion of its gloom, whilst his guardian deserved that several times in the day he would count upon his fingers a definite number, and then smile. The time had been had nearly elapsed. The when, upon the last day of the year, one of the guardians entering his room began to converse with his physician upon melancholy circumstances, over his being in a so awful a situation. His sister was going next day to be married. Instantly, over his attention was adapted. He asked anxious to whom, glad his mark of returning and admit to it, of whom, of which they feared he had revived. He mentioned the name of Earl of Benston, thinking this was a young Earl whom he had met within society, always he pleased and astonished them still more by expressing his intention to be present the nuptials and desiring to see his sister. He answered not, but in a few minutes his sister was with him. He was apparently again capable of being affected by the influence of a lovely smile, for he pressed her to her breast and kissed her cheek, wet with tears, loving to the very force of her brother, being once more alive to the feelings of affection. He began to speak with his wanton mood to the congregation of Hon, her congratulate her upon her marriage with a person so distinguished of a rank, of um, every accomplishment she suddenly perceived a locket upon her breast. Over it he was his surprise at beholding the features of the monster. He so long influenced his life. He seized the portrait of Patekas of rage and trampled it upon his floor under her foot. Upon her asking why him why he thus destroyed a resemblance to the future husband, he looked at her. He did not understand her. Then seizing her hands, gazing on her with a frantic depression, a countenance he bade her swear she never wed this monster, for he, he could not advance. It seemed as if the voice then bade him remember his oath. He suddenly turned suddenly round, thinking Lord Raffarin was near him, but saw no one. In the meantime, the guardians of this inn were heard the whole of all this but return of his disorder, entered the forcing him from his sorcery, desired her to leave him. He fell upon his knees to them. He implored, he begged to them to delay, but for one day they attributed this to the insanity. They imagined that taking possession of his mind, endeavoured to pacify him and retired. <coughs> Lord Raffarin had called in the morning after the drawing room, had been refused with every, with every one else. 
when he heard that of Aubrey's ill health, he readily understood himself the cause of it. But when he learned he had been insane, he said solution, a pleasure could hardly be concealed from those among whom he had gained his information. He hastened to the house of his former companion, a constant attendance, a pretense of great affection for the brother, and interest in his fate. He gradually warned the ear of Mrs. Wolverine. Who could resist his power? His tongue had dangers a toll to account. Could speak himself or as of an individual having no sympathy with any being on the crowded earth, save with whom to her, save for her to whom he addressed himself. Could he could tell now, since he knew her, his existence had begun to seem worthy of preservation. If he were merely that, he might listen to her smoothly answers. In fine, he knew him so well how to use a servant's art, on which the will of the fate he gained her affections. A title of the older branch, falling at length to him, he attained an important embassy, and served as an excuse of hastening. The marriage, in spite of her brother's deranged state, which was to take place the very day before his departure for the continent. Aubrey then, when he was left by the physician, his guardians attempted to bribe the servants, but in vain. He asked for a pen and paper. It was given to him. He wrote a letter for his sister, to his sister, conjuring her as he valued her own happiness, her own honour, and the honour of those down the grave who once held her in their arms as their hope and the hope of their house, to lay but for a few hours a marriage, which he denounced amongst heavy curses, a servant's promise that he would deliver it, but giving it to the physician, he thought better not to harass any more the mind of Mrs. Aubrey, by what he considered the ravings of a maniac. Night passed on without rest to the busy inmates of the house, and Aubrey heard with horror, and many more easily he perceived, inscribed the notes of busy preparation, Morning came and the sound of carriages broke upon his ear. For we grew more almost frantic. Curiosity the servants of last overcame their vigilance. They gradually stole away, leaving him in custody of a helpless old woman. He seized the opportunity and one bound was out of the room, and in a moment found himself in the apartment which all were nearly assembled. Lord Referim was the first to receive him. He immediately approached, and taking his arm by force, held him for the room, speechless of rage. When on the staircase, the friend friend whispered in his ear, Remember youth and no, it is not your bride today, your sister is dishonoured. Women are frail, so saying, pushed towards his attendants, who roused by the old lady woman, had come to search him, or he could no longer support himself. His rage was not vent, or finding vent, had broken a blood vessel, he conveyed to bed. But th- that this, not to mention to his sister, whom was not present when he entered, as the physician was afraid of agitating her. A marriage was solemnized, a bride and bridegroom left for London. Baldry's weakness increased, the fusion of blood produced symptoms of near approach of death. He desired his sister's guardians might be called when the midnight hour had struck. He readily related closely that the reader was pursued. He died immediately after. Guardians hasted to protect Miss Aubrey when they arrived. Too late, Lord Aunt Referin had disappeared, and Aubrey's sister had flirted, gutted the first of a vampire. Extraction of a letter containing an account of Lord Byron's residence of the, uh, in the land, island of Bullier. Account of Lord Byron's residence. His will was all but Byron. Were to choose in his place of rest. A preference, his guidance. He sailing through the Grecian archipelago on the board of His Majesty's vessel in the year of 1812. We put in the harbour of Mephili, in the island of that name. The beauty of this place, a certain supply of cattle, vegetables, always to be had there, uh, induced many of British vessels to visit it, both men of war and merchantmen, whom it lies rather not to attract the ships bound to Syria. Its bounties apply with pay for devation of the voyage. We landed, as usual, at the bottom of the bay, and while some men were employed in watering and pursuing, bargaining for cattle with the natives, clergyman and myself took a ramble, a cave called Home and School, and other places where we had been before. On the brow of Mount Ida, a small modicle so named, 
We met and engaged a young Greek. As our guide, who told us we'd come from Circo, with an English lord, who left the island four days previous to our arrival in the Lucia. He engaged me as a pilot, said the Greek. He would have taken me with have, would have taken me with him, but I did not choose to quit Melody. But when I was likely to get married, he was an odd but a very good man. The cottage over the hill facing the river belongs to him. He has left an old man in charge of it. He gives Dolomic, the wine trader, six hundred Zillions for it, about L two fifty English currency. I was only there for about thirteen months, though not constantly, for he sells his his food. Lelia, very often to the different islands. His account excited our curiosity very much. We lost that time in hastening to the house where the, our countrymen resided. We were kindly received by an old man who conducted us over the mansion. It consisted of four apartments on the ground floor, an entrance hall, a dining room, a sitting parlour, and a bedroom with a spacious closet, closet annexed. There, simply decorated decorated, plain green stained walls, marble tables on either side, a large myrtle in the centre, a small mountain fountain beneath, which could be made to play with the branches by moving a spring fixed inside a small bronze venus. In a leaning posture, a large couch of the sofa completed of stage furniture. In the half hall stood a half a dozen English cane chairs, an empty bookcase, there were no mirrors, no single painting. The bay chamber was merely a sink, large mattress spread on the floor, with two stuffed cotton quilts and a pillow. There were a common bed throughout Greece. In the sitting room reserved a marble oasis, formerly the old man told us, filled with books and papers, which were in the state large seaman's chest closet. It was open. We did not think ourselves justified in examining the contents. On the tablet the recess lay Vedotard's shape beard, Balulu's recitals, works complete, Balulu's ruins and empires and in the Greek language, Kogman's Messiah, Kodobot's novels, Chuka's play of the robbers, Milton's Paradise Ross, an Italian edition printed in Parma in 1810, several more pamphlets for the Greek press out of Constantinople, much torn, but no English book of any description. Most of these books were filled with Marginal notes written with a pencil in Italian and Latin. The sire was literally scribbled all over them and marked with sips of paper, of which also were marks. The old man said, The Lord's been reading these big books. The evening before he sailed, I forgot to place them with the others, but, said he, they must lie until he's returned, for he's so peculiar that the, where I move one thing without orders. He, he would frown upon me for a week together. It is oh, other ways very good. I once had him did him a service. I produce I had the produce of his farm for the trouble, take care of it, set twenty zorins with a pay and an aged Armenian resides in a small cottage in the wood, whom the Lord brought here from an amber junior oak. I don't know for what reason the appearance of the house of Ter- was pleasing. Apollo Tilico was in front, was fifty paces along, and fourteen broad, and the floated marble pillars, the black plinths and weight fretwork colleges, as if new co- now customary in Grecian architecture, were c- considerably higher than the roof. The roof, surrounded by a light stone balustrade, was covered by a fine coloured tunnel carpet, beneath an awning of strong coarse linen. Most of the house tops are thus finished, as upon the Greeks' paths, their evenings in smoking, drinking light wines of Liston, the Christini, eating fruit and enjoying the evening breeze. On the left hand, as we entered the house, a small steamer glided over grapes, oranges and limes, clustered together its borders under the shade of two large myrtle bushes. A marble seat with an ornamental wooden back was placed on which we were told the Lord passed many of his evenings and nights till twelve o'clock, reading, writing and talking to himself. I suppose, said the old man, praying, for he was very devout, and always attended our church twice a week besides Sunday. 
The view of this seat was what may be termed a bird's eye view, a line of which Rhinelands yards later, the eye of Mount Calculia, covered with olive and myrtle trees in bloom, on the summit of which an ancient Greek temple applied its majestic clay. A small stream issuing from the ruins descended a broken cascades, tilted lost in the woods near the mountain base. A sea smooth as glass and a horizon over unshadowed by the single cloud terminates the view in front, a little on the left, through a visa of lofty chestnut and palm trees, several ha- small islands were distinctly observed, shuddering the light blue wave with spots of emerald green. I seldom enjoyed a hobby more than I did this, but were well, encouraged with fruitless to the name of the person who had resided in romantic solitude. None knew his name but Dominic, his banker, and who gone to Comedia. The Armelian who said our contractor could well be i'm sure he will not i cannot tell you my old friend said i if i can said he i dare not he had no time to visit the army but on our return to the town we learned several curious of the isolated lord he proportioned eight young women girls when he was last known upon the island he even danced with them at a natural feast Neutral feast. He gave a cow to one man, horses to others, and cotton and could see it with the girls who li- lived by weaving these articles. He also brought a new boat for a fisherman who lost his own girl, and often gave Greek testaments to the poor children. In short, he appeared to us, from all we collected, to have been a very eccentric, malevolent character. One sentence we learnt, which our friend at the cottage Thought proper not to close, had a most beautiful daughter, whom the Lord was often seen walking on the seashore. He had brought her a penio forte and taught her himself the use of it. Such was the information for which we departed from the beautiful island, peaceful island of Mid Mid Lane. Our imaginations of all, all the rack, guessing who this rambling Greece should be. be. If money, it was reverent. He had Polyphony disposition, and all those eccentricities which mark peculiar dreamers arrived at Palomaro, the old doubts were dispelled. Finally, in company with Mr. Foster, the architect of pupil of the Watts, who had been travelling in Egypt and Greece, the individual, said he, about whom you are anxious, is Lord Byron. I met him in my travels on the island of Tendos. I also visited him at Medellin. He never had heard of his daughter's fame, as he'd been some years from home. But Clive Toilet Holy, Howley, being put into our hands, we recognised him close of Caloria. In every page, deeply not did we regret not having been more curious researches at the cottage, where we consoled ourselves with the idea of returning to Metaphorfly on a future days. But to me, that day will never return. I make a statement, believing I do not quite, not quite understand him, just as his lordship's good name, which had been closely slandered. He had been described as an unfeeling deprivation, averse to associating with home in nature, or contributing in any way to smooth its sorrows. I had its pleasures. In fact, it's directly the reverse. I mean, and many of you plainly gathered from all these little anecdotes. All the finer feelings of the heart so elegantly depicted, his lordship poem seemed to have this, have a seat in his bosom. Tenderness, sympathy, and charity appeared to guide all his actions. His courting and imposts a solitude of an additional reason for marking him as a being of whose heart religion have set a seal, over whose head benevolence have thrown her mantle. No one can read and reading pleasing dates without feeling pride of him as countrymen. With respect to his loves for prejudice, I do not assume a right to give an opinion. Reports have been ever received with caution, particularly when directed against man's, man's own integrity, and he dares justify himself above an awful tribunal where all, where, where almost, all must appear. Although my sense of the efforts 
a fellow mortal. No Byron's character, worthy genius, to do good is a secret, and shun the world's his foot claws. He is the surest of testimony, various heart and self-approving conscience. The end.